Welcome to the Conversational Flow, a KCAS podcast. Hello, and welcome to the second episode of the Conversational Flow, an official podcast of KCAS Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCAS is a bioanalytical CRO serving the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries for over 40 years. Unlike KCAS other podcasts, the weekly bioanalysis, which features news and topics more generally associated with the world of bioanalytical and biomarker services, the conversational flow will focus more on the niche of flow cytometry and its role within the greater industry. My name is Adam Cotty, uh, Senior Director of Cellular and Flow Cytometry Services at Flowmetric, a KCAS company, and I've been in the flow cytometry space for about 15 years. I'm here with my co-host, Brian. Thanks, Adam. Brian Wiles, I'm the General Manager of the Flowmetric site, uh, a KCAS company, um, and we are here just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, I've been here for roughly a year, and I've been in the flow cytometry space in CROs for about 12 years now. Excellent, thank you. Brian and I are members of a growing leadership and scientific advisory team at KCAS. Either or both of us are available to answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCAS services. While our KCAS main headquarters is located in Kansas, we also have sites on the East Coast of the US and in Europe. We're both here in Philadelphia, and Jeremy, our producer, is in Missouri, so we are truly all over the map. We're ecstatic to have you listening to our second ever episode of our podcast, which will be available virtually everywhere. Wherever you choose to find and play your podcast, you will likely find the conversational flow. We welcome all of you, whether you're joining us for the first time or if you're a regular listener to any of our other podcasts. Today's episode will be a review of the latest news and resources, and then a focus on a topic of our choosing before discussing any feedback we receive from you. We're constantly looking for topics, and we'd be happy to discuss something that you want us to cover. So again, we're fired up to have you here, and we're looking forward to a fun episode today. To kick us off for episode two, Brian is going to go over today's podcast topic a bit before we jump into the news and resources section. Brian? Thanks, Adam. Today's topic is sample collection and processing and how both processing and collection can impact downstream flow cytometry analysis. All right, Brian, let's dive right into the news. Thanks, Adam. In terms of recent investment news, a couple of the big stories that I'm following are around um, some recent acquisitions and some new fundraisers. So in terms of acquisitions, both Selectus and Solares uh, were acquired by AstraZeneca and BMS, respectively. And I find these uh, very interesting because um, it shows that even though the gene therapy and cell therapy space have been undergoing a lot of changes, a lot of um, impacts due to the tighter funding environment, still uh, Big Pharma is buying up these assets and potentially at a significant discount to uh, develop them into long-term assets. So that's a, a very interesting development and really shows the strength of the area and the strength of the science that's really behind it in terms of uh, a long-term winning formula for a, a drug development. Right, and the continued consolidation in the space uh, up into the big pharma landscape. That's exactly right. You can think about it, especially the Solaris, which is more of a, a manufacturing technology than a, a drug asset by itself as um, a way to um, optimize what a pharma company can get out of a single manufacturing environment. So the more um, cell therapies and gene therapies that one specific pharma company can have, the more efficient their manufacturing facilities will be and the less they need to worry about some of the downtime that is um, really um, becoming a significant pain point for the, the smaller pharma vendors there. Gotcha. Um, the other investment news that I'm watching is um, sort of on a related note, as um, we've seen this tight funding environment sort of stay um, longer than anybody really initially thought. Um, it's been going on for more than a year now in, in the biotech space. We're still seeing venture capital funds uh, close significant new rounds of funding. So um, here there is an announcement early November that um, several investors had closed more than $6 billion in new funds. And that's a lot of, as they call it, uh, dry powder waiting to find 
good targets and good companies to invest in. So do you see that more as something as an indicator that the market is turning or is this something that's somewhat independent and maybe the market is changing in that respect? I see it as potentially both, right? I see um, a potential turn, maybe not back to the the heydays of um, the pandemic when uh, lots and lots of uh, money was going into biotech in a lot of different directions, but um, definitely a significant upturn in the uh, potential market in the near future. Um, but then I also see that this money is really chasing assets and um, ideas that um, are, you know, have a strong commercial viability uh, target on them, as opposed to some of the more optimistic uh, projections uh, from previous rounds. Yeah, I'm sure everybody would uh, enjoy seeing the market turn, uh, you know, and there's tons of targets out there, a lot of fantastic science. You know, you're talking about cell therapies, and uh, we even touched on that a little bit on the last uh, podcast, uh, you know, uh, near and dear to both of our hearts as far as both being involved uh, in our graduate work and then um, a lot of the work that we do now uh, and, and seeing these therapies come to light and uh, getting to that next stage of uh, off the shelf, uh, off the shelf, excuse me, cell therapies. That's exactly right. And that's a good segue into our news section. Um, and here it's less about uh, investments and more about um, sort of medical developments. Um, and the two that uh, I've been tracking in, on that front recently have been the Vertex um, hearing with the FDA, uh, where they talked about off target uh, DNA detection. Um, and the um, reception to the Keytruda combo with PADSEV at ESMO. So the Vertex and uh, CRISPR therapeutics hearing is around um, off-target DNA modification detection. So that's still around the gene therapy space. Um, and it was actually a primary focus of my, uh, my graduate studies where we would go through and look uh, through a genome and try to find places where CRISPR was cutting in places where we didn't expect it to be cutting. Right. And so that's really interesting. Uh, obviously, with these sorts of therapies, you want to be able to target it and you want to target it very carefully because if you're off target, that could cause problems, right? And uh, so what were some of the things that you had uh, researched in your graduate work? So Exactly that, right? Um, basically, how accurate is CRISPR? There are more than 3 billion base pairs in a, uh, a standard genome. So the likelihood of a very um, close similarity between the CRISPR target and an off-target site might be only one or two base pairs. So how accurate is CRISPR at finding the target that you're um, aiming at versus um, some other targets? And that has a lot to do with um, both how you design the CRISPR mechanism, as well as how um, you select the appropriate target uh, for the CRISPR to um, go after. And in the case of Vertex and CRISPR, um, basically the FDA is saying that um, they have done sufficient work to identify any of these off-target sites, and they no longer need to focus on um, really broad uh, sweeps of the genome to, to find new sites. And when you say they've identified sites, is this for a specific therapeutic or is this just broadly the actual technology itself? Uh, this is for their specific therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the FDA was satisfied with the um, number of different targets that they were um, looking at um, to say that there was no off-target cutting. Yeah, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, a large part of that is due to some of the improvements in the CRISPR technology they're using. Definitely uh, CRISPR therapeutics is at the, uh, the forefront of, uh, of that field. Um, but then also, again, due to the um, you know, pretty thorough uh, search they did for off-target uh, effects there. Um, definitely an interesting story and definitely something that we'll continue, continue to follow and potentially even uh, discuss with our in-house expert, uh, Carrie Bildehall, on, on follow-up meetings as well. Um, but I do want to switch over to uh, the ESMO conference. So um, ESMO is a, a very um, significant conference with the oncology community. And um, one of the rare things that happened was a standing ovation uh, for 
um, a the results of a uh, pivotal trial or a phase three trial um, with Keytruda and Padsev. And this is interesting because, um, you know, it takes a lot to make a, a bunch of oncology professionals actually get out of their seats and cheer. Um, but it's also one of the first times where some of these um, more advanced therapeutics, in this case, a, a checkpoint inhibitor and an antibody drug um, conjugate, are being used in combination and being used as a first-line therapy um, versus some of the other treatments. Um, so really bringing the advancement in drug development and in biological understanding um, to the forefront of treatment as opposed to a last-ditch effort. That is uh, incredible to think about. Uh, I know we uh, Keytrude has been around for a little while, and uh, has so many uh, con so many trials uh, do the uh, combination therapy now uh, with Keytrude. Uh, it's just been such an important player uh, targeting PD one and uh, it's demonstrating efficacy in a broad range of uh, onco targets. There, that's exactly right, and. You know, what a lot of um, industry watchers are, are looking for is now basically to um, differentiate, you know, which combination is going to be best for which specific type of, uh, of cancer. So um, this um, was specifically um, used in a urothelial cancer, setter, cancer setting, um, but potentially each of uh, the different types of cancers um, may be best targeted by a different combination, uh, depending on how accessible they are to the medications and what the mechanism of action are. So definitely a lot more work that can be done, but this is a very promising first step. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and just love the picture in my head of uh, people getting up and cheering for uh, advancements in science. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of, of course, uh, in terms of KCS news, we were at a few conferences as well. Um, I can't recall if there is a direct, uh, you know, standing ovations, uh, but definitely a lot <laughs> of um, discussion and um, appreciation of some of the uh, the ongoing work. Um, so the, the two that we attended in the recent uh, past here are uh, MetroFlow and AAPS uh, PharmSci 360. Um, in terms of MetroFlow, definitely um, that was a, a smaller regional conference focused on user groups um, that work with flow cytometry. And the primary focus there is, is really everything spectral. So everything from how do you use spectral, how do you interpret spectral data, um, what are the best types of controls for spectral flow. Um, but it was a pervasive influence on the, the conference and definitely something on the top of everyone's mind. And so we had a number of uh, our team there, including yourself, correct? That's correct. So we did go with uh, three scientists and uh, myself and uh, some of our, our business development team, and we're able to attend uh, all the talks and uh, follow up with all the, the vendors on site. Um, so a lot of good connections made and good discussions had in terms of what the future of flow is and um, how we can facilitate it getting there. Yeah, I've been really excited to see with the adoption of Spectral Flow, just the community coming together and sharing information, you know, considerations for Spectral Flow itself, uh, you know, going to Cyto and uh, discussing about the impact of dan tandem dyes uh, on controls. And uh, just here, also, our team was talking about information that they had gained from going to Metro Flow. Um, it's been uh, something that, uh, you know, we're obviously newer in the space in that this year we brought in uh, both of our spectral flow cytometers. But uh, certainly with the experience, uh, our, our team, uh, several on our team have already been in that platform for a long time. Uh, well, I, I guess that's all relative considering uh, standard versus uh, spectral there, but uh, for, for a while. And uh, yeah, just seeing it advance so rapidly and uh, it get adopted uh, has been exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, you hit the, the nail right on the head there by calling it a community. Definitely, uh, there are a number of people that have been coming to the MetroFlow meetings for, you know, two, three decades um, and was um, inspiring to hear about, you know, where uh, Flow was when they first started, how they contributed ideas that uh, were then leading to some of these next generation technologies and um, you know how ready they were to work together to figure out what the next steps were. Um, so definitely a lot of uh, good signs there.
So I got to ask, I know when I came back from Saito, I had presented you with a list of things that I wanted to purchase and things we needed <laughs> to investigate. Uh, what, what's something that's at the top of your list in coming home from Metroflow? There is no shortage of uh, new shiny toys that we could purchase, definitely. I think one of the things, and this sort of relates back to our first podcast as well, um, could be um, more on the uh, Omic software package. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, definitely a lot of people were very excited about that as a good way to work with Spectral Flow and a good way to transfer data quickly and easily between different groups. Right. That seems to be one of the main selling features is just being able to collaborate much more quickly, almost in real time, uh, essentially utilizing that software. I think there are other features too, right? Uh, what are some of the other things that you like about it? There are, um, and you know, some of them can be uh, the option to include uh, automation and or AI uh, or, or machine learning into uh, the gating strategy mm-hmm. um, to ideally make the results a little bit more robust, a little bit more um, automatable um, throughout the process and scalable, um, especially as you get into these very, very large data sets, um, having a computer do a first pass and then having a, um, a human supervisor come through and verify that the gating is correct is a, a much, much uh, faster and more efficient way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so definitely something that we're very interested in. Now, I have to be completely open and honest here. That may have been considered in the court of law a leading question because last time, I think several times we got into machine learning AI and you called out each time, like, there it is again. There it is. Yep. And so, you know, kind of wanted to lead into that. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that kept coming up about um, spectral flow, of course, was um, the importance of um, all the fundamentals of flow is right as well, right? So we can absolutely talk about like these uh, these very advanced analysis techniques, but you can only analyze the data that you're presented with. All of that depends on the reagents that you use. So tandem dye specifically being a concern, the controls you use to unmix that data, um, but then also the samples that go into it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just going back to your other point uh, about Omic, I know the company that uh, sells that platform, they uh, had a paper up in Saito comparing the gating of scientists versus gamers that they had actually trained gamers on how to do flow cytometry analysis. It's all in the understanding of, you know, what it takes for machine learning and uh, getting to the point where you have consistent gating and you're following rules and everything. Uh, I think that's a, a paper that uh, at some point we should bring up on the podcast. I, I think people would be really interested in it sure absolutely yeah gamification is an excellent way to do uh science very quickly in in a very fun way Mm -hmm. for sure all right and um you know with respect to the um sample preparation piece and its importance for um you know, spectral flow or flow in general, or just immunology in general. I know our um, our main topic is around that as well, but our paper of the month um, I thought was also useful. And this was a, a paper published in uh, the AAPS journal um, and something that would be uh, definitely a focus of conferences like the AAPS uh, PharmSci 360 conference. Um, and this is actually from a group just down the street from us um, in uh, Springhouse Innovation Park, which is uh, just outside of Philadelphia. So it's by uh, the Janssen team, um, and it's called The Optimization of Peripheral Blood Mononuclear Cell Processing for Improved Clinical LE Spot Assay Performance. A mouthful, of course. Um, <laughs> it definitely is. Uh, it's... Um... Very targeted, though, Uh, really elegant in the the way that they had addressed the question. Um, And so uh, really, it's really core with what we do. Um, It mentions about LE spot assays. However, they address generating PBMC, so peripheral blood blood mononucleosites. uh, And that's a sample type that we'll get into in the main portion of our discussion uh, really gives a lot of flexibility uh, in analysis, especially when it comes to flow cytometry. Uh, the ideal is obviously to analyze fresh samples. And I, 
I don't want to just dive into the main portion, but um, with PBMC, one of the problems could be contamination from other cell types, specifically in granulocytes. And so that's what the paper was really investigating and seeing if they could get uh, antigen responsiveness uh, by improving the quality of their PBMCs. And so, um, Brian, what are your thoughts on the paper? I thought it was uh, very, very well done. Um, and um, very thorough in terms of how they went through and all the experimental conditions they tried and how detailed they were with the methods that um, they proposed to address the issues. So a lot of times people will just use the manufacturer recommendations for all the um, FICOL processing or SEPMATE processing and not really explore too far outside of that because once you start exploring outside of the manufacturer recommendations, um, the number of variables you have to explore can be pretty significant. Um, but this paper did jump right into those and um, really found something that would be extremely useful for clinical trial processing in general, where frequently um, processing in less than eight hours is not feasible, um, and uh, then showed how it could be done and the exact modifications that would need to be made to facilitate. Right. And so the main modifications that they were talking about was in increase in centrifugation time going from 10 minutes to 30 minutes or an increase in blood dilution. And so what this allowed for was a reduction in the contamination of granulocytes within the overall population uh, that uh, they were generating. And that allowed for a longer stability of that antigen responsiveness uh, going at least out to 48 hours. It uh, looked like some, depending on what they were looking at, could go out 72 hours uh, as well, um, as opposed to seeing that signal drop significantly at the four hour time frame if there was that contamination. That's exactly right. And you need a very sensitive assay like the LE spot that they were using in the study to be able to identify those small changes. Um, you know, if you're looking at a, a less robust endpoint, you may not detect the changes um, in the PBMCs or their functionality. But with um, this type of analysis, it's definitely essential to get the best possible prep of PBMCs. Yeah, they did have uh, flow cytometry on there. And uh, to your point, the, the robustness of the readout. So looking at uh, CD3, CD4, CD8 uh, as a frequency apparent. And uh, for us, I mean, we're aware that, you know, PBMCs are generally stable out to three days. Uh, well, I should say the sample before being prepped into PBMCs, generally stable, uh, 48 to 72 hours. Um, and that is definitely what they're seeing with those markers specifically. So the large main markers uh, maintain that. It is when you start looking at the intricacies, the, the signals, um, specifically for the LA spot, uh, interfering gamma, uh, such as those kind of change a little bit more. That's exactly right. Um, definitely, if you are asking a question about what does a cell look like, uh, then this uh, basically can stay static for a longer period of time. If you ask what can that cell do, that's an entirely different question, and you get a, a very different answer in terms of when you an ask that question. Um, so definitely um, hats off to the authors for coming up with this um, you know, strong uh, exploration of this topic and um, ide uh, ideally, and for Janssen at least, uh, extending the uh, time frame where this uh, question can be asked. Yeah, I really enjoyed that paper. Uh, good find by you there and uh, great by the Janssen team over in Springhouse, our neighbors. Uh, and so perfect segue then into sample collection and processing pre procedure and how that might impact flow cytometry analysis. And so, you know, we go back and forth on that all the time. Uh, what What is the ideal, right? And it depends really on what your downstream uses are. Uh, if you're looking at an RO assay, uh, you're looking at fresh samples. And so, you know, going in that your stability is going to be limited, 
by how long that uh, fresh sample uh, is going to be stable. Whereas if you're looking at uh, more of an IP uh, assay, something like that, you can tend to utilize uh, frozen PBMCs, for example, uh, and uh, or fixation as well. So uh, a couple of different options there, uh, whether you're looking at Cytochex or Smart Tube. Um, but really, it's kind of the garbage in, garbage out. If your sample is garbage, then your data is not going to be pretty. And at the end of the day, nobody wants to publish data that doesn't look good. Um, and you want to be able to rely on strong data, right? Uh, especially if you're supporting clinical trials. Um, and so, what are some of your thoughts, Brian, uh, as we get into this discussion about samples? Yeah, absolutely. I think about it as a decision tree, right? So you need to start off, as you say, asking what category of samples am I going to be processing? Um, and you can bucket this in a, a couple different um, ways. You can say, all right, am I going to do fresh versus frozen? To your point, there are um, pros and cons of each one. Definitely fresh samples. Um, you can um, get sort of a, a more true to life, if you will, um, representation of what's going on in that sample, um, less of an impact from any of the processing steps in between. That being said, if you can test on frozen samples, then you can avoid things like a batch uh, testing effect where, you know, every time you test a sample, was your cytometer set up exactly the same? Um, are your controls behaving the same? Is the analyst uh, processing your samples having a good day? So on and so forth. So um, definitely a lot of, um, you know, considerations on which avenue you're going to take. And a lot of times, as you said, the biology is really going to govern that first decision. Is it going to be fresh or frozen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then when you do make the decision, say you want to go down the road of a fresh sample, you have considerations there. A lot of times with a fresh sample, you have various collection sites that are going to send them out. And so if you're going to take a fresh sample, but then you want fixation, right? You've, you've got to understand whether you're using Cytochex or using SmartTube. Is the site set up? to be able to handle the fixation? Um, is the site, uh, you know, how, how does it work as far as uh, making sure that sending out notification? Um, that's one of the things that we talk about a lot with our clients is notification. I know it's not something that's the easiest thing, um, certainly, but it is so incredibly useful for operations, as you might imagine, and making sure that you've got everything uh, set as those samples are arriving. Um, you know, and so some of the key considerations, and I know the collection sites do, uh, <laughs> obviously a ton of work, very hard working and, uh, a fantastic job of, uh, collect collecting the samples, uh, and getting them sent out. Um, and so uh, the other step is, if you would then pair that, or you want to do PBMCs, right? And again, are the sites prepared to be able to handle something like that? Um, and going from the paper that we just spoke about, if we have sites preparing PBMCs and you have a large study has multiple sites, each place could have some variability in the way those samples are prepared. And so is your assay robust enough to be able to support that variability? Or is it better to have all the samples collected as whole blood and then sent to a central place such as our site, we do PBMC processing or a central lab site that does the same thing um, to ensure that there's a lot more consistency there for PBMC prep. Sure. And, you know, really all these decisions need to be happening while you're in the process of validating your assay, right? So we say fresh samples, but fresh samples are not a, a monolith. Um, you mentioned uh, fixation. So the sites have a, a couple options. You can um, choose a tube type like sodium heparin or sodium citrate where um, the cells would be drawn into a tube with the anticoagulant already in it. Um, or you could draw into a tube like Cytochex that has a fixative already in it. Or you could have sites draw into a, um, you know, a 
sort of standard two type like sodium heparin and then add uh, additional fixatives in it or even the BD fix lice uh, process um, and then freeze down and send it. And each of these approaches have um, pros and cons and can either extend the stability of a certain marker or in some cases actually mask the antigens that you're looking at. Um, so critical there is to understand your assay and understand um, the antibodies that you're going to be using and make sure that you're titrating on exactly the right type of sample. Um, oftentimes for clients, we'll, do, we'll um, identify in this step uh, with a matrix comparison um, before we start into the main part of an assay validation to understand what um, the different properties of different um, fresh sample types are before we uh, start in on the, uh, the longer road of uh, qualification or validation. Yeah. And so what does that look like? Uh, somebody comes in, uh, they want to understand what is the best path for them doing that comparison, right? And so identifying which kind, of, which sample type you might look at, uh, whether it's a PBMC, it's a, it's a fresh, uh, it's fixed, and uh, looking at what the panel, how the panel performs uh, in each way. Uh, there are times where you could even split them up. Uh, you can get a, a fresh sample, uh, do true count, and then freeze uh, to PB, uh, process to PBMC and freeze and uh, get a look that way on what your samples look like. And the reason that that's beneficial is you get the, that, that uh, true count look up front, but then on the back end, you can batch all the samples, all the time points together. So if you're concerned about batch effect or something like that, you might be interested in having all of the time points be run in the same batch. And that, that gives you that flexibility. Obviously, there are other ways that you can go about uh, trying to monitor and batch effect, making sure you've got uh, rainbow bead calibration, uh, depending on what type of parameters you're looking at, whether it's uh, MFI, um, MESF, or if you're just looking at percentages, uh, percentages being uh, easiest of the group uh, to, to keep an eye on, uh, especially too, as far as validations are concerned, qualifications, those percentages hold up and uh, are generally uh, very robust. Um, and so once you've identified what the assay is going to look like, the next step is to draft a plan, whether it's qualification validation plan, and then go through the process of looking at various test scripts so you can quantify the assay. Uh, you want to look at uh, intra assay, so how repeatable is, is the is it um, the assay itself um, within a, a single day, uh, multiple replicates versus inter assay, where we're looking at samples uh, generally in, in multiple days. If we're comparing between machines, the um, uh, inter instrument test script and then inter analyst as well, looking at different uh, scientist uh, processing. Uh, and so these are all primary test scripts that we run. There's a whole suite of them that uh, really give you an eye then on performance. You can understand what sort of weight you should be putting into each one of the reportables. Um, part of that whole thing is also then to identify up front what are the reportables that you're looking at? What are the key ones? And Adam, before we go too far down uh, this, uh, the, the rabbit hole with uh, validations, um, you know, definitely enough there for another podcast entirely in terms of what is uh, a good fit for purpose validation and things like that. But you said a couple very important things I wanted to go back to. And, uh, you know, just to a reminder that, you know, not all of our um, listeners will be as exposed to the, the flow cytometry background. So we may have to have another section just on uh, flow cytometry abbreviations and things like that as well. Fair but enough. Um, with the true count tubes, um, definitely an advantage there of using true count tubes or the reason why you'd want that and you can only get it from, pro, from, uh, from fresh samples, sorry, uh, would be that uh, if you want to get an absolute count of the number of cells per microliter, then true counts are one of the best ways to do it. Um, there are generally three acceptable methods with flow cytometry for generating absolute counts. One is to use true uh, count tubes, which have... Um, a very well-defined number of beads per microliter. And you can essentially um, understand your flow rate of beads 
understand your uh, concentration of beads per microliter, and then use that to extrapolate uh, your absolute cell counts per microliter. Um, and then you can understand, um, as Adam had mentioned, either um, that sample specifically or any other sample that was derived from it. So, um, you know, if you want your, your steak and lobster, if you will, both fresh and frozen at the same time, um, one thing that uh, you can absolutely do is to um, get some sort of absolute measurement on fresh samples up front and then come back for frozen analysis and then with calculations um, sort of extrapolate from your fresh sample to your frozen sample. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I know I get passionate about it and you <laughs> sometimes get a little carried away and, uh, you know, uh, appreciate you uh, reeling me in there. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, the, the other two ways I did want to mention uh, for getting um, absolute cell counts there um, are, um, again, with fresh samples, if uh, you use a, um, a volumetric cytometer um, that will actually pull up a defined uh, volume of fluid and then run this through the uh, cytometer at a, a defined flow rate, um, then you can calculate an absolute cell count uh, from that uh, value. Um, so cytometers with that uh, function would include things like the, uh, the Cytec Aurora uh, that we've uh, recently gotten in, in uh, our ship facility, as well as the Quantion uh, from Agil Agilex and uh, other cytometers as well. Uh, and then the last method would be to actually use a human, um, a hematology instrument to get the absolute number of lymphocytes and then back calculate uh, from there um, using the lymphocytes in your uh, flow cytometry count as well. So three different methods to get the same sort of thing. And then, Adam, the other thing that you mentioned was controlling between batches using uh, rainbow particles. And these are a type of, a, of synthetic particle with a well-defined fluorescence. Um, so exactly as you mentioned, if you want to minimize the amount of change in between batches of, uh, of flow samples, then running these types of samples will allow you to compare the magnitude of the fluorescent signal uh, between batches. So essential for things like um, RO assays, where you really need to know exactly how many receptors are on a cell um, and doing that on fresh blood. Uh, this is one of the ways that we can harmonize instruments um, either um, on a global scale or longitudinally uh, within patient sets to make sure you're getting interpretable data throughout the trial. Yeah, uh, it's a, a great background. Uh, and certainly, too, as we go through, I uh, would love to know what the knowledge base of our audience is. And so uh, anytime you want to leave us some feedback, uh, if we're explaining things too much, if we're not explaining things enough, uh, it would certainly be good to know. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, again, uh, thank you, Brian. And so then Let's see, as far as our uh, main agenda topic, if we go back to it, uh, we've already discussed then fresh samples. We've discussed to an extent fixation. Um, but the other point that I'd like to make as far as fixation is concerned is we like to look at it uh, because it can change the epitope. And what does that mean? Well, antibodies bind based on what's combined to what's called an epitope. And uh, it's a very specific interaction where if that epitope is changed, you can think of it like a lock and key. If you change that lock, that key is not going to open that lock anymore. And so what fixation may do is it may alter that to the point where either the antibody is not binding as much or it's not binding at all. And we certainly see seen examples in panels where we've had markers that we've used all the time on fresh samples, but for whatever reason, when we go into cytochecks, for example, um, and just using that as an example of fixation, uh, that it's not binding the same way. We're not getting the same results. Either there's no more of a bimodal peak, or there's maybe a smear instead. Uh, and so it's important to understand that. Absolutely. And all the time we'll see um, clients or assays that have been developed in one matrix 
And then when we go to transfer it to a different matrix, maybe the clone selected is no longer optimal because of that exact effect that you mentioned, Adam. The epitope that um, was available in one matrix is no longer available in the other um, and will disrupt the functioning of the entire panel. Right. And that's why not only do we do titration on the appropriate matrix, but then we run optimization because we want to make sure that there's no interference, steric hindrance, something like that, where even though the antibody may bind on the single antibody basis of titration, when you put the entire panel together, it may not perform quite the same. Uh, I actually did have an antibody I had to kick out when I was doing my thesis work just because of that, it was, it was losing the signal. Uh, whenever I was running the panel, the first time I did it, I thought I just didn't add my antibody and uh, ran it a couple of times. And, you know, certainly that's where you learn. It's really important when you're making your master mix that you've got to move the tubes over you've got to check off the boxes so that you know what you did so that you reduce that frustration at the back end if you're seeing a signal that might be a little bit aberrant absolutely correct um definitely an iterative process where each step uh in a lot of cases needs to be done in sequence um otherwise you will uh open yourself up to repeating a lot of work there mm-hmm so I know we've uh, gone on a lot of tangents uh, from this, uh, appropriate tangents, I certainly would say. Uh, but any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with as far as uh, sample collection and processing? Well, I did want to get into PBMCs, um, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I know we led in with the paper that was already talking about uh, PBMC processing and, and went through it in great detail and did a great job of it. Um, but just to highlight that um, this can also have a pretty significant impact on um, downstream testing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the paper itself used a synthetic um, freezing medium uh, to minimize the type of activation. Um, that you can get from PBMCs if you use something uh, like um, FBS or FCS. Um, and that's an important thing to consider as well. So with frozen samples, uh, you had mentioned, you know, who's going to do your processing? How can you make sure that um, everyone that's going to be doing the processing is doing it consistently? Um, and the reagents that you use for that processing can be just as important. Um, mm -hmm. So that can be everything from the uh, type of anticoagulant used in the collection tube before PBMC processing to the materials and uh, kit that you're using to um, separate the cells, whether that be density gradient or magnetic based or uh, some of the other methods that are available um, and uh, then the, the freezing uh, medium itself. So a lot of uh, different parameters that you can um, explore, but a lot of parameters that you need to make sure stay constant throughout the course of the trial. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, just uh, backing up FBS, FCS, so uh, a fetal bovine serum, fetal calf serum, uh, generally used as part of a freezing procedure uh, for samples, can be used for blocking procedure as well, um, and is also used in cell culture generally. Uh, and so it can have factors in there that cause uh, activation uh, is something that, um, you know, we need to be careful about. Sure. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and so uh, th this is a huge topic. Um, many uh, different things that you can dive into uh, very specifically. But, um, you know, what it boils down to is really what are you, what are you looking at at the end? And uh, from there, designing an assay that makes sense for you, that's going to provide you the out output. And it's also going to be robust. It's going to be repeatable. Uh, and that's obviously at the core science. You, you don't want to be able to get the data one time. You want to be able to repeat that data. Uh, and uh, so that's really um, part of the decision here. Um, and, you know, part of the experience that we bring to the table whenever we're trying to set this up. Um, and so you you mentioned uh, one thing earlier I had to go back to. Uh, back in the news, you're talking about uh, Keytruda and the uh, the ovation. Um, 
I still got to talk to Jeremy about getting us a, an ovation button. Um, I, I don't know how <laughs> we'd necessarily play it, but we <laughs> talked about that, a laugh track, um, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, so um, I think I really appreciate that paper, Brian. Um, very informative. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, indeed. And uh, Jeremy, I think at this point that we usually go to uh, feedback from fans and questions. That's right. We actually have one or two that have come back from listeners of our first episode. Uh, we have one that was uh, short but sweet from Darren saying, great kickoff, gentlemen. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. And so do we have information on how many people actually listen to it? Yeah, I'll be gathering those, and uh, we can uh, we can kind of discuss that amongst ourselves. But safe to say, it's been a pretty healthy number, especially since we have the previous podcast that people have already become accustomed to, uh, kind of tuning in for. Uh, that we had kind of a waiting audience for this one, and people responded very well. Excellent, and yeah, it just uh, you know jumping back. Thank you, Darren. Always love uh, getting some feedback. Um, you know, uh, would love to hear what you liked, uh, what you didn't like. And then we have another from Utam who says, very much looking forward to listening to your expertise and passion for flow cytometry and the impact it will make in the drug development process. Great. Excellent. Well, appreciate the, uh, the words of support there. Um, definitely that is what we're looking for. Um, you know, basically how can we leverage all of the technology we have, all of the um, people with years and years of experience to make the drug development uh, process more robust, faster, um, and um, ideally get uh, more flow data into more uh, regulatory submissions. That's all the feedback this cycle. So I'll go ahead and hand it back over to you guys. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so, Brian, were we very punny this week? You know, we were not very punny, um, and that's that's a failing on our part, Adam. You know, we'll have to collect uh, correct this on the, the next podcast. Ordinarily, we can't get through more than one or two um, conversations without some sort of pun. But in this case, um, we we have been too focused on uh, the sample collection process and not enough on uh, you know the flow of, of humor, really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess we were joking around as much. You, you get us into that uh, work mode, into talking about samples and whatnot. Uh, I guess we, we hold back on the puns. Maybe that's for the best for our clients so that they're not uh, rolling their eyes during calls. All right. Um, something to aspire to for next episodes. I feel like this pun episode uh, pun count is going to be a little bit lower, um, but we can work towards that. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. There's time. That's true. So last time we talked about weekend plans, and uh, I was mentioning this too a little bit, Brian, but uh, kudos to you for your recommendation. Uh, when we were out, uh, what was it? I, I got pulled pork, and I, I told you I really like the, the vinegary taste of some types of pulled pork, and you were giving me the rundown of all different types that are out there and uh, indicated that I seemed to have a preference towards North Carolina pulled pork. and so. I decided this weekend to pull up a recipe and to see if that was in fact true. Not that I was doubting your wisdom or anything, um, but uh, I did. And so the first thing as I'm going through this recipe, it calls for a three pound shoulder pork butt, whatever. Um, I didn't realize that your shoulder and pork butt are somewhat synonymous I, I thought the those two names i mean maybe Most would assume shoulder versus butt right it's two different things but nope uh, yeah they're, they're roughly synonymous at least from what i was reading um please don't hold back if i'm wrong on that but uh, anyways the smallest one i could find was six pounds so I had to double that up and my wife was concerned it wasn't going to really fit in the crock pot but it just fit like right just barely touching the top of the, the lid there 
And so roasted that thing the whole day and the house just smelled amazing. And by the time we got down to it, I, I had three sandwiches. My wife had some. My daughter had some. The next morning I wake up and my wife's having it for breakfast. My daughter's <laughs> telling me how she was going to go for like a third sandwich. And then just last night she's having more. So this six pounds will probably continue feeding us for a while. And everybody seems to be really pleased. So thank you for that recommendation. Indeed, indeed. And, and you guys are uh, well trained, I guess, for turkey coming up as well. So, <laughs> yes, that's indeed. Do you do turkey in a crock pot? Oh, no, no. Uh, you know, I've tried it baked. I've not tried fried yet. I hear good things. I've tried it grilled um, and I've tried it smoked. I think not smoked may be my favorite, but it, smoked it sounds like it'd be really good. But man, frying just scares me. I, I would want to be far away from my house if I tried that. Correct. And make sure the turkey is not frozen. It's not frozen. Yes, yes. So that's a big fireball you're waiting for right there. Right. Um, so how about you? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of uh, hiking last weekend, uh, hence still getting over all the allergies from that. Uh, but then another round of hiking planned for this weekend. So basically, there's a very short period of time between when all the bugs are essentially dead and uh, before it snows where you can really hike and enjoy yourself. So I'm trying to take full advantage of that. Now, is that the case? Uh, so the, I'm assuming you're talking about hiking down in Georgia, correct? That's correct. Um, so do quite a bit of hiking uh, along the Appalachian Trail. And yes, the bugs are terrible um, in uh, summer and late summer. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to wait until they die a little bit after the first freeze, which we just had uh, about a week ago. And then uh, you can be relatively comfortable. Um, and then, you know, if you wait too long, then you can actually get like sort of winter. Now, I, I say winter, uh, of course, for in Georgia means something a little bit different than uh, Philadelphia or Kansas, but um, still cold. Right. And the reason I was asking about that, too, is because up here, certainly you, you're not seeing the mosquitoes, uh, all of that, but you've got ticks still, which I learned several years ago that they still go right through fall. And so you got to make sure to get your bug spray on and uh, cover up uh, so those little buggers aren't uh, crawling on you. Um, I'm unaware. Is that the uh, same problem? You guys got ticks down in Georgia? A huge problem, and towards uh, your weekend story as well, if you get bitten by the wrong kind of tick uh, with a specific kind of disease, I want to say alpha-gal, mm -hmm. um, then it can make you allergic to meat, and specifically red that. meat in a lot of Isn't cases. Isn't that the Lone Star tick? Yes, indeed. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh my yes. Goodness. And I don't mean to laugh because I would never want to have to deal with that. And, um, you know, I, my I have family members that dealt with Lyme disease and all that. So certainly very serious. Um, I just, uh, you know, the thought of uh, any of those complications. But, uh, yeah, uh, certainly always in my mind uh, going through the woods. Did do similar to you a hike this weekend. And so it was all covered up and you know, yeah, uh, you got to keep an eye out for that. So last thing we got on here is Halloween costumes. So just last week was uh, Halloween. Uh, and you and I were both dressed up. We weren't alone uh, at work. Uh, you want to talk to everybody about your costume? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a, a old standby uh, skeleton costume. Uh, that is great. So wearing the, uh, the onesie, um, actually, I had to take a flight on Halloween day, so I got to go through the airport in my uh, my skeleton onesie and then uh, show up at work a little bit later. Um, but uh, always a fun time to see everybody in, uh, in decoration and things like that. And that's distinct from the skeleton that you have sitting in your office. That's correct. Um, yes, this is a standing decoration. that will also make some appearances for Thanksgiving and Christmas and St. Patrick's Day and things like that. <laughs> I love that you got that skeleton in there. Uh, aside from the times when I start to walk in your office and then walk out because I think somebody's sitting in a seat, but that's <laughs> a different story. Um, yeah, so for mine, uh, I, I pulled out a oldie but goodie as well. So had a, a prisoner costume. I think it's more like old school prisoner from, I don't know, early 1900s or something like that. I, I don't have the bag for it anymore. So um, I, I will be honest and say, Saying that it had fake blood on it that uh, got spilled from storage. It had candle wax that had melted in because I had it in my attic and evidently there was a candle on it. So I don't know, I might be retiring that one soon. 
additional character. Yeah, um, it is. And and, people did think that I it was purposeful, the blood, so can't complain too much, I guess. All right. Um, and Adam, I, I guess that's a, a good spot to try to wrap up uh, this episode. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, bring Dominic and John onto the episode this week, uh, but definitely we'll look to do that for next week. Um, also, for uh, our next episode, we're looking into considerations for spectral flow. So going more into the reagent side and data analysis side of things as opposed to the, the sample preparation side. So looking forward to some exciting episodes and some interesting discussions moving forward as well. And then we're also looking to guest participate. I, I hesitate to call it guest starring, um, but you know, <laughs> maybe more for you. Um, I, I'll go low key. I'll just guest participate <laughs> on their st- uh, podcast soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We'll we'll call ourselves stars. That's fine. So yeah, we'll guest star on their episode. So looking forward to that as well.